Well, we'll get rolling today and uh, get into the Word. They're still doing the discipleship class over there and um, cost of discipleship, so that's got one week left. I think this is the third week on that. And so um, we'll uh, get everybody back together uh, starting next week probably, so hopefully. But uh, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get... I think I left off on number five. Every word has been chosen by God, I think is where yes. I left off at. And so we'll... We'll pick up there and, and go from there. But let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you for this time when we come together and open your word. And I thank you, Father, for the, um, the power that you have to preserve it uh, in time for us and our language that we might know you and understand what it is, Lord, that you um, want of us and, and what of you are to us. And Lord, what you want us to accomplish in the times that we live in. And I pray, Father, we would just take it to heart as we um, open it and take it from here. May we keep you in the forefront of our mind as we go about our way this week, just knowing, Lord, that your word is pure. And, uh, and Father, what you say is, is what you want, what you desire. And, and I pray, Father, we would take that to heart in our own lives. Father, we give you praise and glory in all things, for it's in your name that I pray. Amen. All right, so we're on number five. Every word uh, has been chosen by God. And so um, every word has been chosen by God. There's a couple of verses there, John chapter 20, verse 30 through 31. So the, the, the lines on those in point A, every event, phrase, and word has a specific purpose. So at the top there where it says that on point A, every event, phrase, and word is that first blank. Purpose is the second one. Uh, God has a very specific purpose for every word, every number, every comma, every colon, everything in that book has a very specific purpose. And so John 20, verse 30 through 31 says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. And so God, Christ did a lot of other things that, were, that are not in this book. He specifically says that. So he, he handpicked, hand chose, and, and placed each word, each event, each thing that he did. He specifically recorded it, preserved it, that we might have it to teach us something from it. Every one of them is important and has a purpose. John 21, 24 through 25 says, This is the disciple which testifieth of these things, and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. He did so much stuff that, according to John, oh, Larry, you want to come in? Or get, I'll, I'll leave the door open. Yeah, we shut the door on you. We'll leave you open a little bit. Oh, no, shut. I'm sorry. I can't leave the door open. It's naturally shut. Oh, all right, man. All right. So, uh, so anyway, but every he he did so much that you could fill a whole every book in the world with what he did is what he's saying. That's what he says. But yet he preserved and kept and held on to specifically exactly what he wanted us to have. Right. So the key to understanding the Bible is not that's your number one. There point is not not through thoughts. Messages, concepts, or ideas, but through the individual words of Scripture. It's the words. It's the individual words. It's not the idea, the concept. It's the words that tell the tale. Um, I, we have to, you know, I, I'm careful now and, and listening to people when they're talking to me. You know, sometimes people, they'll come up and they'll say things like, man, God told me to do this. And, I, and I'm guilty of it. I've, I've been guilty of that in my life. And maybe sometimes he did, maybe sometimes he did, maybe I thought he did, but maybe he didn't. You know what I mean? The only way I know what God tells me to do is what it says in that book. That's it. The rest of it is just how you apply it. It's what he wants us to do is in this book. I don't need any direct vision. I don't need any voice in my head. Um, I don't need that. Uh, I've got every word that God wants me to have to instruct me in what he wants me to do right here. This is not a, a you know, God doesn't, he's, he's not doing what he did in the Old Testament today. He's preserved his word, and we've got everything we need to know right there in that book. 
So again, the key to understanding the Bible is not through thoughts, messages, concepts, or ideas, but through the individual words of Scripture. Um, Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And we'll jump through a few of these and and look at them. But Deuteronomy chapter 6 is one of my favorite passages in the Bible, specifically in regards to to building a home. There's a lot in Deuteronomy chapter 6 about the home and the family parenting, teaching kids, and all that. But we're going to look at 6, 6 through 9. So Deuteronomy 6 and verse 6, where he says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. So here's the attitude that you need to have with it, right? Put them in your heart. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when, they, when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. So here's what Moses' focal point at this point to the God's people was the words of God. It's the words of God. These are what, this is what needs to be before your eyes. It's not some grandiose idea. It's not some concept of, of what God desires of you. It is the words of God. And when that gets in your heart, you can't get it out. You know, you can't get it out. I mean, it's just there. And once it's there, it, it drives your life. And, and every time you try to walk away from it, <laughs> because I have, you know, but you just, you, you, when you do that, it's still there. It's like you can't escape the Word of God. I tell people, that I've told this to, to people at different times, that you know the most confirming thing to me about Christianity is not the feeling of it or church or the praise. It's really just the accuracy and the truth of the words that are in the book. That's it. That, that's it. I mean, that's the, that's the legal document. If that's... Man, it's, it's played out for thousands of years, and it's still playing out. I, you cannot deny that. You can, but you're lying to yourself if you are. Um, and that's why it's so important to know the words and understand it, what God's doing, what He's done, and what He's going to do in the future. So um, Psalms 33 is the next one I think we're going to go to. Or 8, no, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 8.3 um, was the next one on there. Now that I flipped too far somebody gets there and they want to read it, go ahead. Or I got there. And he humbled, so Deuteronomy 8, 3 says, And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So Christ quotes that verse, right? He quotes that verse in the book of John. And so you see him quoting this verse where God does not live by bread alone. God gave them manna. He, he kept them alive. He, his provision was from him. Their provision was from him. But he's saying, listen, <laughs> at the end of the day, it wasn't the manna that kept you alive, right? It's the word of God. God said, let there be manna. God said, I'm going to provide for you. God said, I'm going to take care of you. It's not the stuff we have. It's what God stated that kept them going and doing what God wanted them to do and to humble them for that purpose. The focus was the word of God. So we'll jump down to the next point too. there. There's some additional verses in there you guys can grab and look at. But the Bible doesn't just contain. Okay, that's the first line. Contain the words of God. It is the Word of God. It doesn't just contain it. It is it, right? It is the Word of God. Um, It's not a... God preserved it very specifically for a purpose, exactly as He wanted it. It is His Word. It says it's His Word. You know, we looked at that in Deuteronomy. Um, It is His Word, um, the Word of God. So it doesn't just contain it. It is it. And so what we have today that we get from God in any communicative way, at least in any kind of written word, is right here. God has everything that we need right here to guide and direct us. It is His word for us today. So God has promised, point B, God has promised to preserve, is the line there, preserve. 
Every jot and tittle in his word, everything. Matthew 5.18 says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, or pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And so I want to show this to you because he's preserved these things. These are, these are marks um, in the Hebrew language that he's talking about here. And if you go back to Psalms 119, we will look at the smallest of letters in the book of Hebrews. In Psalms 119 and verse 73... And you'll see verse 73, right above verse 73, you see a letter there. And the way Psalms 19 is written, it's written with the, the, the alphabet of the, the Hebrew language. And in them, you'll notice that each stanza has, um, what is it, seven, eight verses, seven, eight, eight verses. Each one of those verses, each one of those passages begins, each one of those verses begins with, that particular letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so when you see that word in the New Testament, jot and tittle, jot, this is the smallest alphabet in the Hebrew language, which is above verse 73. So when you look at the mark to the left of that, that is that letter in Hebrew. So that is how small he's talking about preserving every jot, every tittle. So he preserved it all. And it's still there for us today. Every mark, every, everything is all preserved within the book or translated accordingly and preserved uh, into the book. The smallest uh, mark distinguishing between point two there, tittle is the smallest mark distinguishing between two Hebrew letters, right? So it's like, like an apostrophe, basically, is what that would be. The smallest mark between two Hebrew letters. So if you go to, there's a couple places you can see this, Psalms 119, 25, since we're in the same chapter. Verse 25, um, you can see above the letter there, off to the left you have the, the letter. The separation between the letter is just the tip of that little brush stroke up to the top left of that is what you're looking at. It's just that little bit of a flag. It looks like a little flag facing to the left. Just that little stroke is what you're dealing with there. So he preserved, Christ says, I'm going to preserve it all, every bit of it. And we have it today. He's preserved it for us today. So it gives you an idea when he's, when he's saying these things, how accurate and how perfect the book is. Point C, if you approach the Bible with the attitude that every word, that's the blanks there, every word, so every word is important, it will change, right? Change the way you read and understand God's word. So change is the, the blank there, the next one, the second line. So every word, it'll change the way that you understand God's word. When you begin to understand that every word of God is in there for a specific reason, trying to figure out why that word's there becomes important, right? I mean, it's a, it's a big deal as to why that word is there. Um, and I'm going to give you a list. You've got a list, I think, of key words and things like that that we'll, we'll go through some of those later. But I'll use one of these. Um, you know, if you look at, and this is kind of Bible, Bible numerics um, down here, but when you look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 31, so the, the, the word sin in the Bible is listed 448 times. This is how accurate this book is. It's amazing. 448 times, right? We know that blood covers sin, right? It covers sin. Well, it's listed 447 times. So why is that? 447, and it's written down there for you, I think, isn't it? Yeah. 448 times you have the word sin, you have the word blood 447 times. Well, look at Matthew chapter 20, or Matthew chapter 12, and we'll, we'll kind of look at why. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31, says this, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But, 
The blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So you have this blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, right? Well, how do you not get saved today? You don't get saved by simply rejecting what God tells you to do, right? That's what you do. I mean, for us, the only way the blood doesn't cover our sin, that is the issue. It's if we don't accept or trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, the blood ain't covering you. If you're a lost person today, blood ain't covering you. That's it. So when you look at the Bible and you look at the accuracy of the number, even the numbers in the Bible, and you see that word sin showing up 448 times, and you find blood showing up 447, and the Bible says there is one sin that is going to keep you from being covered in the blood of Christ, that's why. It's accurate. It's that accurate. It's amazing to me. That the only sin today that we cannot get covered by the blood in is our rejection of Jesus Christ. We're saying, in effect, I don't believe the Word of God. That's what we say. If you're, if you're, not, if you're not saved, you're a lost person today, and you've rejected Christ, that's it. That's the only thing that you... All you got to do is ask. Right? So, when you look at that accuracy, uh, John chapter 21, verse 11, this is another numerics thing. And there's a couple of things to this that I don't grab, but I will tell you this. The number nine, we're going to get into numerics in, a, in a, probably a month. But when we do, you're going to see the number of fruit bearing is going to be nine. There's nine fruits of the Spirit. It's in the ninth book in the Bible. There's nine letters in the book of Galatians. I mean, it's accurate to the letter. It's amazing how accurate this book is when you look at the numbers in it. All right? Nine book, ninth book in the New Testament, rather. So you look at, you look at nine... So John 21, 11, he's dealing with the fish there. And I think there's other reasons for this, but I haven't studied this all the way out. But what I can tell you is I know the number of fruit bearing is nine. And in, in uh, I'm in Matthew 21, not John. I need to jump over. Somebody got John 21, 11 there? Want to read it? So he goes back. This is after Christ died and resurrected. And Peter, not knowing what was going to happen, what he was going to do. I mean, he already told him that, you know, he was going to be used, right, to build the church to some degree. He, he's a key figure in that in the book of Acts. And we know that that rock is Christ that he was talking about in prior chapters. But at the same time, Peter was, he was the man up front in Acts chapter 2. And so God used him. So he's gone back now to fishing, right? He's gone back to fishing uh, because he doesn't know. Christ is gone. He, you know, the Acts chapter 1 hasn't come yet. They haven't talked about what he's going to do. And so he just jumps back on the boat and goes fishing in, in uh, John 21. But he catches 153 fish. What does it add up to? 1 plus 5 plus 3 is 9. You want to live a fruitful life, give up the junk you went back to and get back with Christ. It's really a simple, it's a simple equation, right? Come do what's fruitful. Leave your junk behind and do what's fruitful. I give you 153 fish. You know? Um, and I know there's other reasons for that. And I think it has to do with the Old Testament building of the temple and some, some builders of the temple and numbers and that. I, I just haven't studied that out. But... There's other reasons for that number. But the simple, simple one is come be fruitful, you know. Um, so every word, every name, it's, it's incredibly accurate. And when you begin to look at that, it just is mind boggling to me how accurate it is. No, there wasn't a guy that wrote this book. I mean, God used men, but God wrote this through men. He, he laid it out exactly like he wanted it. So I think we're on meanings of names from the line of Cain. So here you have, um, I didn't miss anything on that last page as far as I know. So on the next page, meanings of names, right? So you have the, God, the two lines laid out. We've talked about the seed uh, being sown. So on these, meanings of names from the line of Cain, uh, which starts in Genesis chapter 4. So Cain means, and I think these are blank, aren't they? Yes. Means fabricator. 
He's self-made. So think about Cain. Self-made. He's a fabricator. Think about what he did. When Cain and Abel were called before God to present a gift, what did he do? He fabricated it. He made his own. Instead of trusting the God's provision in the lamb like Abel did, he fabricated his own way. False religion, in many ways, began right there. It began probably in chapter 3, but, but the reality is man began to work the way to God with Cain. And that's what false religion does. we got to work our way to God instead of accepting the grace of the Lamb, right? So Cain, self-made, he's a fabricator. Enoch, um, to train up, teach, initiate, right? So you see this line coming up. So you have the fabricator, you have the teacher. Um, Irod is in the line of Cain. He means fugitive. So he's a fugitive. Um, literally means running guilty. So even the names, you can see the line of false religion coming out through Cain. Um, so running guilty is literally what Erod means. Mahuyail, if you pronounce it that way, that's like a half, half Aramic, half Hispanic, half Eng or third, third of it, maybe a quarter of multiple languages to say that. But it literally means blot out God. Blot out God. So again, you see the ongoing line of false religion coming down out of Cain. Methuselah, man who is God. That's what that means. So you see the line of the Antichrist coming all the way out from Cain all the way down through the Bible. Man who is God. What's the Antichrist want? What did Satan want? He wanted to be God. Still does. Still wants to sit on the throne. Lamech, overthrower. To be made low, to overthrow. <clears throat> right? Jabal, another one. I don't know why I want to say the yeah. I got the yah thing going on with the whole Jabal. I, we, I was in court one night and there was an officer who couldn't pronounce a guy's name like <clears throat> that. And he pronounced the J three different ways in the midst of his testimony. It was funny. And the guy was sitting there going... What? Anyway, I won't, I won't say the name because I don't want to assume, but it was kind of funny. So anyway, um, where was I? Jabal and Jubal. So Jabal means body of water, but Jubal means carried away with the flow. <laughs> you see the, even the connection. Water is a type of the word of God, right? Well, there's false words out there, false water out there, false lines of bad water all the way down through the word of God. Tubal Cain, offspring of Cain. So if you put that into a phrase, which we did at the bottom, I got to give you all these, all these words. I should have just printed these out for you. The self made man, that's your first blank at the bottom, has trained the running guilty to blot out God. And now, go ahead. Repeat that, please. Self-made man this is the first line. Trained is the second. Running guilty is the third. Blot out God is the fourth. And now, the next one is a man who is of God, which is just taking the names and laying them out. Will be overthrown. So overthrown. With water. As it carries away. Carries away is the next one. The offspring of Cain. J 
John 8 says what? We have our father, the devil, who was a murderer from the beginning, a liar from the beginning. And we were carried away. So you could see even the names of God that God used are used for very specific things. So when you look at the line of Adam through Seth, which was the replacement, right, for Abel in chapter 5, Seth replaces Abel. So you've got Adam, which means living man. Seth literally means replacement or substitute. Enos means mortality. Canaan means fixed or set. Fixed or what? Fixed or set. And Leo means the praise of God. And Jared means to descend or come down. Enoch, again, means train up, teach, or initiate. So you see some of these names, they're, they're running in the same line, right? Methuselah means his death shall bring judgment. And Lamech means overthrower, to be made low. And Noah means to rest or comfort. So put them in a paragraph or a sentence. You see living man has been replaced. With mortality. And it is fixed. Combine the next one, Mahalio and Jared. But the praise of God shall descend. I give you a minute on that one. To train and teach. And his death shall bring judgment. And the overthrower. And then rest in comfort. So in those names, you see the beginning of Adam dying, man's corruption, Christ coming, dealing with our sins, right? Bringing judgment unto the, the Antichrist and finally rest in peace and comfort in the end. So you can see, I mean, these names are incredibly important. And when you begin to study and teach the Bible, it's important to understand them. God gave us those names. Those children were even named. And that just shows you how much detail. I mean, for me, what that does to me is make me realize that God has just as much as he had a specific purpose for 
who, whichever one of these guys you want to pick, he's got a specific purpose for you. That's how detailed he is. You know, when you go back and look at Psalms and he talks about knowing every member of your body before he made you, that's pretty darn detailed. I mean, he knows exactly what he's doing and exactly why he's doing it and exactly what he's going to do with you and with me and what he did with them. So we'll jump on some important notes. Um, I think is where we're at, important notes. So there's some words that help you um, when you go through and you look at key words in the Bible and understanding the context of the passage, right? We've got to understand the context before we decide to make something out of it. Always understand the context. Understand the doctrine first. So key words, that's the first blank. Key words and phrases become evident as we do the work. So key is the first blank. Work is the second as we do the work of comparing Scripture with Scripture. Because the Bible's accurate, right? It's, it's accurate. It's like a, if it says something in one place, it's going to mean something in the next place. It, it, it's an accurate book. And so when we look at it and we see phrases like these phrases, we're going to see day of Christ or day of the Lord or those days or woman in travail. Those phrases are used concerning specific times and specific people groups. And it's consistent throughout the whole Bible. And so when you look at the day of Christ, it's a specific reference to the rapture. So just write rapture of the church in there. It's a specific reference to that. Let's look at a couple of these in Philippians chapter 1. So we don't use, we use the term rapture, right? But if I'm not mistaken, that word is not in your King James Bible anywhere, right? It's not there. So we use that word, but what that does is it, it causes sometimes confusion. If we stick with the words of the Bible, then we use it kind of for a common ground, you know, something to, um, so that we can relate to it, you know. But we, because there's, there are days that are mentioned, some, sometimes different phrases, that might refer to the same thing, but they're consistent. So we use the, the word rapture, which is when the church is called out. But in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1 through 6, he says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, Always in every prayer of mine for you, all making requests with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being con confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Right? So he will perform the work in me until the day of Jesus Christ. So whatever work he's doing in me has happened until that day. It ends then. Okay? It ends then. So, go down to verse 10. He says that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So he's talking to, we know contextually, he's talking to the church. He's talking to the Philippians. He's talking to a saved, born again, Bible-believing church right here. So we can throw our, anything in the book of Philippians, we can throw our name right into without, without any question. So he's dealing with believers. He's not dealing with with proselyte Jews. He's not dealing with Old Testament Jews. He's not dealing with lost Gentiles. He's dealing with the church. So when he says he's got a work he's doing in you until the day of Christ, well, the work he's going to do is going to go on until that day. Go over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. There was a great question on Wednesday night about a passage in the Old Testament. We ended up in 2 Thessalonians <clears throat> Um, I think chapter 4, but in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, 
as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Okay? So keep going. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now notice there's a difference between that day and the day of the Lord. There's two different phrases. So, um, oppose themselves, uh, who opposeth and exalteth, verse 4, himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. So he's laying out the process, right? You have the day of Christ. You have the... So the day of Christ is when our work's done. We just looked at that, right? We looked at that in Philippians. It's when our work is finished. Then you have the revealing of the Antichrist, and then you have that day in order, which is the day Christ comes back. Three different events, three different times, three different places. God's moving and doing different things with different people groups. So you have the day of Christ. Now, if you go over a chapter, and we can kind of look at this a little bit, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I think, is where I was going, or 3 and 4, right? I'll get lost here for a second, then I'll find it. Four sixteen. Let's see. Yeah. Um, so this these passages lay out uh, the coming of Christ in the resurrection, right? So I'm trying to go through and find a particular. That's that's where I want to end up. Yeah, so if you look at this, you see in verse, say, 14 of chapter 4. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will go bring, will God bring with him. All right, so now he's talking about Christ coming back. He's talking about the dead that are in Christ. And he says in verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the, in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So you have here the coming of Christ for the church. You're dealing with the dead, those believers that are still alive at the time that he comes back. And that's what's going to happen. He says we're going to be called up in the air. I don't understand how that's going to happen, but that's what he says is going to happen. So then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet them, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, verse 5, chapter 5, when he starts, so you have the rapture of the church again, substituting that word. The coming of Christ for the church is what, that's what's going on in chapter 4. Chapter 5, he says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfect, perfectly that the day of the Lord... All right, here's the next one, which we're actually going to roll into that. So the day of the Lord, the next one on your sheet, day of the Lord points to the second coming of Christ, not the rapture of the church. And we'll see how this breaks out. It's it just reading every word. In chapter 5, verse 1, he says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, all right, they shall say, not us. See how he changes the context of who he's talking to there? They shall say. Not us. Not me. We, not we. For we shall. It doesn't say that. It says they shall say. They shall say. So for yourselves know perfectly well the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, again, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. As travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You're not in darkness. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. You're born in the darkness. You don't accept Christ. You're still in darkness. The Jews, still in darkness. That day is for them. It's not for us. Chapter 4 for Thessalonians deals with God coming for his church. The first part of chapter 5 
deals with the second coming of Christ when he comes back and lands on this planet and sets things right. So you see it broken down, and you just see it by every word. If you miss they, was it not pretty easy to read that? I mean, it's just the whole book's to the church, right? The First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, those are written, those are church epistles, Gentile church epistles. But if you miss the word they, which pushes it outside of that group of people, us, it's easy to read that, you know, and just skip that word. Every word of God's important. So... The day of the Lord points to the second coming of Christ. And he even goes on in 2 Thessalonians chapter 5. We look at verse 6. He says, therefore, right, verse 6, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet the hope of salvation. Our goal right now, knowing all this, is to make sure we've got the hope of salvation on, that we are doing God's job for the time that we live in until, just like Philippians said, until we're done, until it's over, you know? So make sure you don't misread that stuff. So the day of the Lord points to the second coming of Christ. Um, and I just read the one in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 and 2. Let's go over to 2 Peter. I'm going to the end of that list of verses. Did I, are the verses on there? Yeah, I think so. I'm going over to 2 Peter. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. He says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. All right, so you see that phrase, thief in the night? You'll notice back in 2 Thessalonians, he used thief in the night in the context of the second coming of Christ when he comes back to this world. You'll see that phrase used in the book of Matthew, I think 23, chapter 24, maybe in there. You'll see that phrase used in different places, and it is always referring to the Jews. It's, it's, it's the thief in the, he's coming as a thief in the night during that tribulation. He's coming in judgment. This is a different setting. So, uh, where was that? Verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner, I think I skipped some, go back to verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. You see the difference between the day of Christ, when the church, when he comes for the church, and the day he comes back? You know, they're not the same day. There's a time period in between them. And so during that time frame, that man of sin is going to be revealed, just like it said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So you have these time frames that are laid out in these phrases. And when you see the day of the Lord, it will always refer to when Christ is going to set foot on his planet and wipe it out. Because that's what happens. I mean, look at what happens on that day. If shall, uh, shall pass away with a great noise and the elements, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That's not the rapture of the church. Yeah. Maybe yes, absolutely. When you miss it, and, and, and here's the thing. The reason we use one Bible, the King James Bible specifically, because if you put another Bible up against that, it's going to fall apart. And that's been the attack. The attack has been on the Word of God since the late 18th. It's been in, since Genesis 3. But on Bibles, the attack has been ongoing on the Word of God. Uh, in our day, since the mid to late 1800s. And you can track, that's a whole other study, but you can trace that down to where the Bible's been changed and manipulated and poor text used. I mean, you can get into all of that, which we need to do a class on that. But the attack on the Word of God does not stop. And if you put another Bible up against this book, they will not hold, they will not hold their ground. You will see contradiction after contradiction just within some of these phrases. It's consistent here. 
Um, and so on that, on that basis alone, I will always recommend a King James Bible for study <laughs> because, you know, um, if you're going to get in the Word of God and study it, you got to have consistency. If you don't, that's where you get a lot of the problems in doctrine today because they're not either the words are changed, they're different, or they they just simply miss them. You know, they miss things like they. They miss things like contextualizing um, phrases like this or, or a thief in the night. There was a movie I remember when I was a kid. I don't know if any of you guys ever see that movie, Thief in the Night? It was terrifying. I mean, I remember seeing that like in junior high, right after we got saved, they were showing that at the churches. And uh, it was about the rapture of the church. And I mean, it's a scary, I mean, if you can find it, it's probably out there on YouTube somewhere. Give it a watch. But I mean, it was terrifying. And, uh, but it really did kind of mix up some of this stuff too. So it's kind of, it's, you know, when you look at it, and that you're right, absolutely, because people don't pay attention to the words. Every, when I say, every word's important. I mean, it's important, you know. And so uh, God has a specific purpose in all of it. So we'll go on to those days. I'll try to get through these phrases. Um, those other verses just back those things up in the Old Testament, the New Testament. Um, well, what's funny, let's go up. To, I will look at Acts 2 because that's important. And because there's so much bad doctrine coming out of Acts chapter 2 that Tony just kind of went through some of this on Sunday mornings. But if you get Acts chapter 2 wrong in our day, you, you're... You're a mess. I mean, there's so much. You've got, in Acts chapter 2, you've got people teaching baptism. You've got peop, uh, baptism of salvation. You've got people teaching tongues. Um, you've got all kinds. Acts chapter 2 is probably one of the, the worst pass. If you don't get it right, the rest of the book of Acts is a mess. And so if you don't grab this stuff, but Acts chapter 2, and, uh, and uh, verse 19, so he says, well, let's go, I don't want to read this whole minute. Let's go back to verse uh, 18. So Peter's preaching here. He's preaching to the Jews in Jerusalem. That's key. Know that he's preaching to Jews in Jerusalem. And all the world of the Jews has come to Jerusalem, right? And at this time during these feasts, during Pentecost, and they are now 18, verse 18, and on my servants. So he's preaching, and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days, of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. All right? Those days. Well, keep going to verse 19. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. So that's going on. In those days, not these days. Now, he's, here's the deal. In Acts chapter 2, he's preaching that accurate as of that day. He's saying, listen, man, Christ is coming. God is coming. He's coming to sort this out right now. He is aligning because at that point, you're transitioning, right? You're transitioning out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You're transitioning Old Testament and New Testament. Acts chapter 7, where Peter gets stoned and the message goes to the Gentiles, hasn't happened yet. They're still preaching, in essence, John's gospel. They're still preaching a form of John's gospel in some ways. Salvation through repentance, baptism, filling of the Holy Spirit via other means. I mean, it's Old Testament stuff. But notice it when he uses that phrase, those days. If you don't understand that, that he's dealing with the day of the Lord, then you're going to take this stuff and you're going to jump right into signs and wonders. And you're, all this Pentecostal stuff that's going on out there, it's right here in Acts chapter 2 because they get this wrong. They miss those phrases and they just grab what the emotion says for them to take. I mean, that's where it comes from and throughout the book of Acts and some places in 1 Corinthians. So notice the phrases, specific phrases, day of the Lord. It's the second coming of Christ he's talking about, not the rapture of the church that hasn't even come into play yet. So he's dealing with Christ coming back and what's going to be happening in that time. And, and if you look what happens up through Acts chapter 7, are they not doing all kinds of signs and wonders? They are. The apostles, the apostle signs, the apostle tongues, all that stuff is going on right then because they're expecting the day of the Lord to come next. 
they're still not seeing the church in its form that it is today. Still not seeing it. And it wasn't there in the same form. So that's what they're preaching. Those days will always refer to a tribulation period of time. The tribulation period of time. When God is getting the attention of the Jews, let's go back and look at, uh, let's look at some of these Jeremiah chapter 31. I mentioned, we've been through Matthew chapter 24 a couple of times and 23, but those, those specific books or chapters are dealing with this too. But in Jeremiah chapter 31, you have Jeremiah preaching and you'll see in... Um, 33, he says in verse 33, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, after those days, right? I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. So the covenant with Israel is going to be reestablished following those days. All right. What are those days? Well, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 33. Verse 15. In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. So in those days is when that's going to happen. During that time frame when he is bringing back together the nation of Israel, where in the land, he's not called that now. You go to Israel now, he's not called that. Right? He says he's going to be called the Lord our righteousness. They're not calling Christ their righteousness now. This is still to come. Still not there yet. So you can see this transition of those days. Um, go to, let's jump to Matthew chapter 24. We'll look at it. Well, I'm not going to read that whole thing. But those days has to deal with, you can go home and read that, but has to deal with God bringing through this period of trials and tribulations the nation of Israel back to Christ. They're back in the land now, but they're not, they're not with Christ now. God got them back in the land in the last century, and they're still there waiting, but God, Christ hasn't come back yet. So, woman in travail, you'll see that phrase. Um, since we're in Jeremiah, go back to Jeremiah chapter 30. And I'll, I'll encourage you to take these verses and just chain them together in your Bible. That way you know. You can find these definitions. Um, just take them home with you. But Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 4, he says, And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. So not me, right? For thus saith the Lord, we have, a, we have heard a voice of trembling of fear and not of peace. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into, into paleness? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. All right, so you have this time frame where the nation of Israel is in travail. Like a woman in travail. He's laying this out. So when you see that woman in travail, it applies specifically to the nation of Israel. Man in travail. Well, it's an odd thing. <laughs> He's using it in that context, though. Right? And so those, those verses deal with that man in travail. Revelation chapter 12. Let's jump back there real quick. We saw it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We already looked at that one. Um, Revelation chapter 12. <clears throat> Verse 1 says, For there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, 
and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars. All right, so you have this going on in the book of Revelation, where we saw a woman in travail, 12 crowns here in the book of Revelation. How many tribes are there? There's 12 tribes, the nation of Israel, in travail. They, they birthed Christ, did they not? So you have these things that all point back again to the nation of Israel, and the dragon shows up and attempts to destroy it. Um, look at verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath placed hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. I'm going to take that and divide that by 365, anybody? I know what time that is? It's three and a half years. Ooh. Okay. You know what that is? That is the tribulation period, specifically stated three and a half year period of tribulation is stated in the book of Revelation. So you'll see that three and a half year period of time showing up different times throughout the book of Revelation, sometimes in different ways. But that's what it is. And so you have that nation being drawn back to God, being chased by the dragon into the wilderness. You find an account of that wilderness time in Matthew chapter 24. And so you see these things and how they line out. So when you see woman in travail, that's it. I'm not going to get finished with this. Um, that's okay. We'll finish it up next week and I'll get you some new pages. Um, but yeah, we'll shut down. Selah appears in context pointing to the believer's rest in the millennium. So that's a thousand year period of time. We'll finish up real quick. Uh, I mean, I can go to all these, but it has to do with the rest. There's a thousand year rest period afterwards. And you see that in the book of Psalms. It's dealing with that thousand year period of rest. Um, you'll see it in the book of Hebrews as well. Three days prophetically points to the resurrection of Jesus when you see that phrase in different places. So resurrect deals with the resurrection of Christ. Um, and you guys have got the verses there. Without a cause, you see that phrase. That's associated with Jesus who was innocent, right? He was innocent. It's, it has to do with his innocence. He was murdered without a cause. He was crucified without a cause. There was no reason. When you see that phrase in the Bible, that's what it's referring to. Is the innocence of Christ. And then innocent blood, when you see that phrase, you'll see it in different places. It's connected to Christ dying while innocent, right? Innocent blood. So when you see those phrases anywhere in your Bible, there's going to be some contextual sense that it's relating to Christ. Christ is everywhere in the Bible, everywhere. And when you see these phrases, they're going to they're going to look at times and things like that. Um, the times and, and this, you know, those days, day of the Lord, day of Christ. Um, those particular phrases are key phrases. Now, on the back of this, and I'll do a quick preview next week. Or, or there's another thing you see some key words and phrases within Scripture that when you see them, um, they will they will help you kind of unlock the book. Um, when you see things like, uh, you know, church, Christian, church age, you're dealing with night, virgin, pearls, precious stones, bride, last days, son of God, uh, referred to as Christians, body, the body of Christ. You see those things that you can consistently through Scripture point to the church age. Um, when dealing with man, you see clay, you see grass from down there in the middle under man. You see flower of grass, you know, the glory of man, vessels, a human body, because we're the vessels that carry the Spirit of God now. So if you just think about that, when it talks about vessels of honor and what is it, First Timothy? And dis vessels of dishonor. When you see those phrases and you go back in the Old Testament and you see vessels in the tabernacle, those are pictures of you. Pictures of me. Those vessels of honor, vessels of dishonor throughout the Bible are going to be pictures of us as the vessel of God. How did we do what God called us to do? So all of those key phrases help you paint the pictures of what God did in the Old Testament. He put them all there for us if we just unlock them and use them. So anyway, a lot of stuff there, but you can go home and keep that, put it on the refrigerator with the 50 other photos and things you got up there like the rest of us. Do. Let's take a look at them. Anyway, let's pray and we'll, we'll get going. Father, Lord, I thank you for this time. Again, we can open your word. Every time, it's just amazing to me 
how accurate and how perfect, Lord, and how full and complete it is. And uh, Father, I pray, God, that you would just um, grace us with understanding, Lord, of your word, that we might not just know it. Because, Lord, our goal is not to just know it. It's to know you and to be used by you to fulfill your purpose in this life with your word as, Lord, our sword. It's, it's what we fight this battle with. Um, it's what we arm ourselves with. It's what we equip ourselves with. It's what we clothe ourselves with. It's what we eat. Lord, all those things that your word says that it is, um, that's what we drink. It is our spiritual life and uh, consistency. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you would just um, help us to grab that, understand it, and apply it in our lives daily. We give you praise and glory in all things. It's in your name that I pray. Amen.